Words at War. Marie? Marie, you better put the paper down. I can't, Charlie. The faces of these Detroit race riders. They're like the boys who sit in my English classes. Oh, not these hoodlums. I don't know. This boy pulling the Negro from the car. Why, he could be Hayes or, or Angelino or, or Flaherty. Oh, could he? Yes. Charlie, something's wrong with the way we teach. With the way I teach. Now put the paper down, Marie. You'll be late. Yes, you're right. I mustn't be late for school. Not today. Why today, especially? Because today we've got to get Hayes before he pulls a Negro from a car in a race riot. We've got to get Flaherty before he becomes a tool of the Christian front. Charlie, they say that the public school system is the best guarantee of democracy. But I don't know. It isn't fulfilling its mission, Charlie. It isn't. And I'm frightened. Words at War. The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, present a radio adaptation of one of the most thought-provoking books of 1944, Your School, Your Children, by Marie Serkin. We're extremely proud to announce that the part of Marie Serkin will be played by the distinguished American actress, Miss Florence Eldridge. A sentence has two parts, a subject and a preterite. Predicate. That's what I said, Mrs. Serkin. Preterite. Predicate, Hayes. P-R-E-D-I-C-A-T-E. Okay. Are there subjects and predicates in Silas Marner? Of course. In Shakespeare, too? Why, certainly. That's what I thought. He don't even write English. <laughs> I've taught them for 18 years. Boys called Tony and Philip and George. Girls called Martha and Elizabeth and Sarah. For 18 years in a New York City high school classroom. And together we've discussed and reviewed such things as Paradise Lost and Silas Marna. We've meditated the agreement of subject and verb. Pondered the use of the subjunctive. And argued a little about Shakespeare. Today, however, we talked about the recent race riot in Detroit. I don't know, teacher. You, you can't trust any of them. Sure, first thing you know, they pull a knife on you. Why, well, it isn't safe to walk along certain streets Wait here in New minute. York. Wait a I don't get all this. They're human, just like us. They didn't start this thing in Detroit. Why, I read in the papers... People say New York isn't America. I tell them I teach in a New York high school, and I know that New York is America. The boys and girls I teach are like the overwhelming majority of the population, the 90% that doesn't go to college. The skilled mechanics, the stenographers, the dressmakers. I see the changing young faces. I read their compositions. I hear them talk. I see the silly scrawl on the blackboard. Before Pearl Harbor, I ran my fingers over a jagged swastika cut into a desk. And I've got a front seat on a democratic process, the high school classroom, the only place where the great mass of Americans can hear the voice of democracy speak out with passion and authority. And I've seen something happen. What was it? Well, listen. Once I recall... We were discussing the story of Joan of Arc. That isn't true, is it? Well, Hayes, Joan did believe she heard miraculous voices. Oh, that's not what I mean. That other stuff. You mean about a leading an army? Yeah. Well, that's a matter of history. She was tried and burned at the stake. Oh, yeah? That's a fact, Hayes. Don't you believe it? No, not me. <laughs> you don't have to take my word for it, Hayes. You can read about her in your European history book. No, sir. But, Hayes, it's a matter of history. It's propaganda. That's nonsense, Hayes. It's in the Encyclopedia Britannica. I've got a right to my opinion, haven't I? I say it's a lot of applesauce. 
No fraudulent hero worship for the young. A symptom, the first symptom of the disease. Believe nothing. Debunk everything. When the 3A kids grin over the story of Washington and the cherry tree, bless their little horse sense. Show the great man in his pot belly. Expose his blemishes. That's the method. And if you create a generation of pseudo-sophisticates who are as bleatingly uncritical in their unbelief as a previous generation had been in its belief, why, what's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. We've been throwing out the baby with the mud bath. We've been tearing down the halo, but also the saint. So what? I'll tell you what. This happened a few years ago in my English class. The precise time was November 1938, after the anti-Jewish pogroms in Berlin. Hilda was German, so I asked her. She was 16 and blonde and blue-eyed. I asked Hilda. Did you read the papers, Hilda? I did. Would you like to give the class your opinion? Sure. It isn't true. Things like that have not happened in Germany. You did read the papers, didn't you? Sure. And you heard it on the radio? It's propaganda, that's all it is. But suppose it isn't propaganda. For the sake of discussion, suppose these outrages did take place in Berlin. Then he must have had a reason. I see. He. Hilda, if you were in Germany today, would you beat and rob a girl you knew simply because she was Jewish? Would I? If I was stronger, why not? Hilda had been born in the United States. Her parents were German, but she was the product of an American school. She wasn't like the Christian fronters and their kind in the school. She was bright. Her IQ was relatively high. Consciously, she was a Nazi. And yet, she didn't worry me as much as the Irish boys who hated England. The Italian boys who felt personally the failure of Italian arms. The other decent boys who read the tabloids and the American first columnist. The United States is a republic, not a democracy. What's that, Smith? What did you say? The United States is a republic and not a democracy. I was surprised. Of course I was surprised. Joe Smith was not given to fine-spun verbal distinctions. He was hardly the type to go in for profound discussion of the nature of the state. The source of the new truth, as I discovered later, was an editorial in Social Justice. He hadn't read it himself, but it got around to him the way those things do. I told my husband about it. Why on earth don't you put these kids straight? It's not quite so simple, Charlie. What do you mean, it's not simple? That's no answer. I'm a teacher, Charlie. I'm not supposed to indoctrinate. I'm supposed to encourage objective classroom discussion. That's bunk. But don't you see anything I tell them is propaganda? Well, show it to them in the books. The books are propaganda, too. Well, for heaven's sakes, what is truth for these kids? That's it, Charlie. Anything that comes through legitimate channels isn't truth, it's bunk. Truth is in the scurrilous handbills, the yellow journals, the street corner meeting. To many of them, Roosevelt or any government spokesman is a liar. Good Lord. What's wrong? Yes. What was wrong? What still is wrong? We in the schools have ourselves encouraged a disposition to question authority and to be dubious about unchecked statements. We did this in order to develop an inquiring mind in the interest of intellectual freedom. With intelligent students, the results have been to make for a more just evaluation of men and events. But with boys like Hayes, it means... You know this stuff you get from the Office of War Information? It's just a lot of bourgeois. This wouldn't be quite so bad if at the same time Hayes didn't proceed to pin his faith in William Dudley Pelly. Yet, it's natural for my pupils to label as bunk a report of Nazi massacres in Poland. Normal young people can't credit the reality of such events. However, when these same young people find it easier to credit the enemy version of an incident rather than the explanation given by our own government, something has gone wrong. 
Isn't it true that Japan had to attack us in self-defense? Do you really believe that, Hayes? A lot of fellas believe that. A lot of fellas in Germany, perhaps. No, no, we're not going to be sucked in by a lot of propaganda, are we, guys? No. No. How do we even know there was an attack on Pearl Harbor? Yes. yes, that's right. How do we know? Well, don't you believe the President of the United States? Oh, don't make me laugh. Don't you believe Congress? No, ma'am. Well, you, you listen to the radio. Don't you believe H.B. Cartonborn or Lowell Thomas? That's nothing but propaganda just to get us into the war. Yeah, that's right. Hey, you don't listen to those pills. They don't know the rear from a hole in the ground. <laughs> now, fortunately, this combination of cynicism and stupidity is not common. But it does exist. It exists in our public schools. It isn't a teacher's function to determine how a school should stand in regard to particular controversies. But some issues shouldn't be controversial. They shouldn't be even issues. Things like democracy and the right to live. After all, a school doesn't flourish in a vacuum. It reflects social forces, politics, life around us. How can the school become one of those active forces? I think that's our chief question. Well, let's look at it. This was a special day. The Board of Education had given instructions to observe George Washington Carver Day. And for once, everything went fine. And, and he discovered how to make ice cream out of peanuts, and paint and candy out of peanuts, and, and things like that. Yes? What did you find out about Carver, Helen? Well, he could have made a lot of money working for private companies. But he said it was more important that he should teach his people how to grow things. Why was that, do you think? Because in the South, the Negroes are poor. George Washington Carver didn't want to help himself. He wanted to show the colored people how they could plant stuff like soybeans and live off it. Off it, Helen, not off of it. Oh, yes, ma'am. You know, I think it's wrong about this here Jim Crow stuff. Well, look at Marion Anderson. Yeah, and Paul Robeson. He was an All-American. Sure, and he's got a son who's better than he was. What a halfback. You're nuts. He's an end, not a halfback. Halfback. And... Well, it doesn't matter, boys. What matters is that discrimination is wrong, isn't it? Oh, sure, yeah. it stinks. Oh, Billy, it... It ain't right, ma'am. Ain't? Isn't right. Thank you, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> it was all very pleasant, and I felt that the Gettysburg Address had left its mark. But the feeling wasn't to last very long. There were a number of colored pupils in the school. Ordinarily, they live at peace with the other boys, but occasionally there's a fracas. This time, there was a fight in the lunchroom, and an ugly brawl developed. Two class periods after the fight, when the school was seething with rumors, I asked my senior English class to write a piece suitable for the school paper, perhaps something designed to improve white Negro relations in the school, and I assured them that their sentiments would not be held against them. Their candor startled me. I think the only way to put a stop to this is to separate the white boys and the colored boys. I don't mean throw one race out of school, but I think they should put one race in the annex. The only the way race. to stop this is for whites and Negroes to have their own schools, libraries, and communities. Well, I suggest we send them back to be slaves or isolate them someplace in a far-off island. They don't appreciate their freedom. First of all, this could be a fight because of discrimination of a race. Everyone should be given a fair break in the school, regardless of race, creed, or color. This is one principle the United States is fighting for. We in the school should fight together to try to understand. Yes, their candor startled me. The majority of the students favored segregation. The fine talk about George Washington Carver apparently had not registered. It was not a particular Negro boy against a particular white boy, or vice versa. It was the white against the black regardless of the right or wrong of the issue. Some of the teachers gathered to talk it over. I say that we ought to hold a school assembly. Right. Thrash the business out while the subject's hot. Mm -hmm. No, that's wrong. Sure, it's wrong. The debate would be too emotional. Oh, well, I of don't course, know. it'll be emotional. What do, what do you want to do? Serve it up as cold potatoes? <laughs> oh, sir, this is the time to call the assembly. Yes, yes I agree. No, no, look. All it'll do is stir up trouble. Oh. My motto is let sleeping dogs lie. Well, well, I don't agree with that. that. And this was the ultimate policy, to let sleeping dogs lie. 
the immediate difficulty was glossed over, and nothing was done to prevent the repetition of a dangerous incident. This was bad enough in my school, but the situation is worse on the outside. In Negro sections, where overcrowding, unequal opportunity, lack of recreational facilities give the Negro a sense of futility and outrage. Whoever makes the Negro feel that he belongs will win him. The communists have long been preaching their revolutionary dogma in Holland. Their appeal is explicit and understandable. But it's not only the Negro problem. There's also another sore. It exists among the students and among members of the teaching profession. Haven't you noticed something? Mm -hmm. The Jewish teachers get all the fat plums. Is that so? Well, certainly, all the soft jobs. Why, I could tell you plenty about how the principal works. Now, one day last month... And it's just a plain case of anti-Semitism. Every Jewish teacher gets sent to the annex. The Catholics get all the cozy jobs. Oh, you don't say. Oh, well, I could tell you plenty if I had a mind. I've known this principal for a long time. He's the kind of a man who... There's no exaggeration in this. This awareness of racial and religious origins has become indecently acute. It leads to a kind of bookkeeping which has nothing to do with pedagogy or the welfare of the school. An unofficial quota system according to which jobs and favors are doled out. Jewish students have become increasingly sensitive. This incident not long ago is typical. And then he cracked that anti-Semitic joke. I tell you that teacher is anti-Semitic. Oh, you're wrong. I'm not wrong. It was just a wise crack. There's nothing malicious in it. Well, I know better. I tell you, he's a Christian fronter. Oh, you mustn't believe that. Perhaps the remark was a little tactless. But I know that teacher. You're just too suspicious. Well, you're developing a persecution complex. Oh, excuse me, ma'am. I'll be late for class. There was a case in one school where a Gentile girl complained that a teacher was making anti-Semitic remarks. Many Jewish students had previously made similar charges. Nothing was done. But now a Gentile girl was making them. And this time, the principal investigated. You say that's what he said? Yes, sir. Not once, but many times. What have you to say, sir? She's making it up out of whole cloth. Oh, that's not so. You did say it. Please. No, I don't want this to go any further. Let's have no public repercussions. I want peace and harmony in this school. But I tell you, he's... One moment, young lady. The charges have been categorically denied, and I accept that denial. Is that understood? Yes, sir. Very well, you may go. What we need in this school is brotherhood. Yes, that's right. That's what I want in my school. Kindness and brotherhood. Well, that's what we all want. By the Lord, we're going to have it. Now, listen here. There are three prizes to give out. Yes? Give one to a Protestant, one to a Catholic, and one to a Jew. Everybody gets his share. Oh, I understand. And I'd like to see the colored boys get prizes. Let's, let's make them happy. If I can't get brotherhood idealistically, by heaven, I'm going to get it mathematically. The principal had hit on an inspired formula. Practical pedagogy with no frills. The incident was closed. Though it was not clear whether justice or expediency had prevailed. But there were other incidents. From the shores of Pony Island, looking out into the sea. Stands a kosher airway warden, wearing me for victory. <laughs> hey, you hear this one? Praise the Lord and draft another Christian. <laughs> and so Abby says, Bell, I'll tell you about my brother in the armed forces. Ah! All over the city, simultaneously, this is what happened. Yes, the verses were amusing and skillful. So skillful. It was obvious no high school student could have written them. There is danger in publicizing a slander. No matter how brilliantly the falsity of a charge is exposed, the aroma of accusation continues to cling. But there is also a danger in not publicizing a slander, a danger in silence. In some schools, the principals met with the teachers for discussion. You know, I don't blame some of our teachers for being upset. Well, neither do I. I tell you, all of our Jewish teachers, in fact, all the Jewish people, have an awful problem facing them. Yes, a matter of fact, in America today, there's no problem half as acute as the Jewish problem. 
Um, don't you think so, Mr. Principal? I don't think this is a Jewish problem at all. This is an American problem. Well, sir, may I, um... Well, may I ask, sir, why haven't we attempted to solve it? If it's an American problem, why haven't we in America's schools done something to solve it? In the schools? What can the schools do? This is a problem for the public official, for the home. But, sir, the duty of the school One is moment. Help... Your attention, everyone. Let's get something straight. I run my school the way I know best. I've done everything I can. It's a good school, and I'm not going to have it talked about before the Board of Education. Perhaps this isn't even a proper matter for discussion here. We're in the business of teaching, not indoctrination. I think that's all. The meeting is dismissed. But isn't it something... The meeting is dismissed. To... I refuse to be dismissed. I beg your pardon. I refuse to be dismissed, sir. This isn't something you can dismiss. We're teachers. We're not teachers for the money in it. We're making less than a fourth-class welder in a shipyard. I'm not griping. I've been at it for ten years. Yes, ten years. I used to think there was something holy about a teacher, something pretty noble, standing up before a group of youngsters, telling them about good things, true things, fine things, how to grow up decent and straight. After ten years, I should know better, shouldn't I? I shouldn't be no so naive, should I? This is a school, not a church. It's both. It's everything. When they're little, we see that they're inoculated against diphtheria and vaccinated against smallpox. Is that all we're supposed to do, keep them from physical harm? I repeat, the meeting is... Look, just... no, wait. You, 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 you've got to let me finish. Look, after Pearl Harbor, we taught them first aid, didn't we? we? We taught them how to detect poison gas. We didn't ask their opinion. We told them. Now we've got to tell them about the poison of race and religious hatred. What's the earthly good of winning battles overseas and losing them here at home? What good is it? The meeting is dismissed. Yes, the meeting was dismissed. Many meetings were dismissed. And what emerged? Once again, the school showing themselves unable, incapable of meeting a challenge to democracy. Oh, there were surveys, there were investigations, notices were tacked up on the bulletin boards. There was even a little activity an occasional school assembly devoted to tolerance, an occasional parent-teacher meeting to promote brotherhood, but always voices saying... No indoctrination. Let the children decide for themselves. Democracy's been around since 1776. Have faith in our youth. The teacher's business is to teach, not preach. All over again. It's not cricket for the teacher to impose her views. No indoctrination. Indoctrination is a dirty word. But our enemies are not at all sensitive about dirty words. They don't exhibit any scruples about trying to capture the minds of the young. You can't laugh it away. You can't laugh away the fact that they have no doubt about the teachability of intolerance. Many teachers stopped laughing. They called more meetings. Well, what do you want us to do? You can't grab them and stuff tolerance down their throats. No, maybe we're supposed to feed the kids love your neighbor pills. Sure, three times a day. <laughs> oh, wisecracks don't help. Suppose we try teaching democracy. There it goes again, the old bromide. Remember, we're teachers. We can't afford to be dogmatic. We <laughs> mustn't indoctrinate. Oh, for heaven's sake. Why mustn't we? Is it wrong to take a stand about democratic ideals? What makes you think that... The, the, the results of appeasement will be any better at Center High than, than they were at Munich. What makes you think you, you just have to fo fold your hands while your students praise William Deadly Pelly and the Christian Front? Maybe you want to uh, shut them up. I want to answer them. Well, they've got a right to their opinion. Have they? Well, have they? Suppose Jimmy gives you his mature opinion that two and two makes five. That's his opinion, isn't it? But you're not going to let him get away with it, are you? No, you're going to tell him where he's wrong. Listen, young people need direction. They don't go in for subtlety. You don't teach them with mirrors. Well, maybe you're right. But what do we do about it? <laughs> That's the trouble. I don't know. There ought to be a plan. There ought to be. Well, there is a plan. In Springfield, Massachusetts, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania... There is a plan. It's called the Springfield Plan. A plan against bias. A plan against prejudice. A plan for dramatic 
democratic education. And it works. To provide opportunities for democratic self-government. To study the weakness and the strength of our democracy. To establish a positive working philosophy based on democratic principles. To evaluate one's own prejudices and bias. To study public opinion in a democracy and to understand how it is influenced. To teach students how to weigh evidence, how to reach conclusions objectively, and how to distinguish between fact and opinion. And we don't depend on the zeal of a few crusading spirits. It's in the school's daily program plan. Right beside arithmetic, foreign languages, and general science. Every hour, every day, every week, every semester. It's not hot air. The Springfield plan works. Yes, it works. In Springfield and Pittsburgh, and wherever the plan is in operation, democracy is not a Fourth of July phrase, but an integral part of the curriculum. It's not a notice on the bulletin board. It's not a speech before the Parent Teachers Association. In Springfield, they are no longer afraid to attack a pernicious influence, whether it comes from the home or the streets or the playground. The Springfield plan works. It works in Springfield, it works in Pittsburgh, it can work in any enlightened community where men and women are willing to roll up their sleeves and say, let's cut out the pussyfooting. Let's start being realistic in teaching our youngsters the meaning and worth of the only political ideal that really works for the people. Honest, fearless, small d democracy. In a few weeks, our schools will hold their graduation ceremony. The boys will put away their sweaters and their lumber jackets and wear neatly pressed suits. And the girls will look pretty in their party dresses and their bright corsages. The color guard will march in with a flag and the graduates will stand and make the pledge to justice and liberty for all. And after the speeches and the diplomas, Thompson will go into the Coast Guard. Riley will join the Marines. DeMarco and Feigenbaum will be accepted as aviation cadets. And they'll come back on their first furloughs, proud in their uniforms. And in this time of life and death for the individual, this time of life and death for a great nation and a great vision, these boys will be more precious to us. And we'll remember once again that democracy is the respect for the worth of every individual. And we'll remember once again that the American school must become the school of an American faith. Yes, that's the task. That's the challenge. How are we going to meet it? Thank you, Miss Eldridge, for a most eloquent performance. Tonight on Words at War, the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, has presented a dramatization based on Marie Serkin's book, Your School, Your Children, starring the distinguished American actress, Miss Florence Eldridge. The script was by Morton Wishengrad, music by William Meter, production, Garnet Garrison. Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.